Good evening, family. Sana here. Welcome to our youth group worship service. We're so grateful that you are here. And today I have the honor and the privilege of being able to share God's word with you today. This is the fifth message that I've preached since quarantine started. And I believe that all of them are special, but this particular one has a special place in my heart because it takes me back to some of the roots and some of the places where I started to preach and minister the gospel to you. So I hope you find some kind of nostalgia, just as I found some kind of nostalgia to this message as I was preparing for it. So once again, I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for those of you who have checked in to what God is doing through Wellspring Youth. Now it's time to do something special. Not only do I want you to tune in, I want you to check in. I want you to pay attention to this. Now I want you to lean in because I believe that God has a word for you in this season of your life, where regardless of what you're going through, God is going to speak through me to your situation today. All righty? So let's hop into this word. Our scripture today is found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. If you have your Bible with you, please turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Or if you have your Bible app, turn there. Or if you just want to use Safari and Google it, go ahead. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. But before I get into this word, let me begin this meditation with a prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for giving me a word that I believe is fresh, that I believe is relevant, and your word is always perfect for the season that people are going through. God, I ask that as I communicate this message, allow me to communicate this message as effectively as I possibly can. For you are the God who spoke life into existence. And this message will have no life if you do not breathe into it. God, use this message to change people's hearts, to bring them closer into a relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All righty. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. But before I begin, begin, I just want to talk about what's going on in this world. Because, you know, when we started quarantine, to be honest with y'all, I know that COVID is a very dangerous disease and many have succumbed to it. And I'm not trying to make light of the situation. But for me personally, when I first thought of quarantine, I thought that quarantine was cute. I thought it was a cool idea. I get to take time off of work. I get to be locked up in a house with my family. I get to spend time with them and get to know them a little bit better. I could, you know, spend a little more time enjoying the hobbies that I've always had passions for, like music and some of the other things that I enjoy to do. And so I thought, this is cool. We get to unwind and get to take a break. And that joy of quarantine lasted a grand total of maybe a month. <laughs> and so five months later, I think it's interesting that what was once cute has now turned into chaos because our world is crazy. This has been maybe the most unprecedented time in the history of humanity, at least since I've been alive. This is a crazy year. The year 2020 will go down as the craziest year, and if we make it to 2021, all right, because God, especially with all this going around, I wouldn't be surprised if God is just ready to come down and end it all and take us back to heaven, which I'm hoping happens soon. But nevertheless, if we stay here, God's going to get glory. Amen. So this year has been insane. And it's been a year that I've just, I don't know if it's me going stir crazy or me just, just not knowing what to do. But when I've been checking up on friends, I ask all of my friends the same question. Everybody that I check up with on Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat or any social media platform, I always ask them the same question. How are you holding up? And that's my message title for you. I rarely preach off of questions, but this is the message title that I want to share with you today. It's a question. How are you holding up? And I just, I ask that question to gauge because I want to know what you're doing to keep your sanity. I want to know what people are doing to be able to maintain in this season. I want to know what people are doing so that they don't go crazy themselves. I'm, some people will say, oh, I'm just, I'm just making do. I'm just living life. I'm just, you know, just trying to make it through. And what's beautiful about this particular notion of what's going on or what's happening, how are you holding up, Jesus talks about this particular circumstance, how we as people can maintain a sort of level-headedness in the midst of craziness, how we can be okay even with turmoil and chaos going around us, how we can find comfort and peace in the middle of the storm. 
And so we're in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. And I remember, as a kid, I grew up in a very sheltered household. My parents did things a lot different than I know a lot of other parents did. And including me not being allowed to drink soda as a kid. I wasn't allowed to eat candy as a kid. And one thing that my parents made sure I did it, I didn't listen to secular music till I was about eight or nine years old. That's the, that's the era and that's the kind of parental guidance that I grew up under. So my parents, as a kid, I didn't listen to Michael Jackson. I didn't listen to Prince. I didn't listen to Chris Brown or whatever musical geniuses that we listen to now, the famous pop stars. I didn't listen to any of that. You know what I listened to? When I was a kid, my parents bought me a Cedarmont Christian Sunday school CD. That's the kind of music that I listened to. I grew up listening to the Gaither Vocal Band, Cedarmont Christian. I grew up listening to Michael W. Smith. Those were like the foundational artists that I listened to growing up. And one of the songs was very relevant because that's kind of the setup for what we're talking about today. And one of the songs that I remember vividly that pertains to what we're talking about is a song that speaks specifically to the situation. And the way that the song goes is, let me think of it, let me think of it, let me think of it. Give me a second, give me a second, give me a second. It goes, oh, I remember. It goes, a wise man built his house upon the rock. A wise man built his house upon the rock. A wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. And then here's the chorus. And the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up, but the house on the rock stood firm. That's a pretty cool song, huh? And that kind of set, it sets the stage for what we're going to read about because Jesus basically kind of word for word says exactly what that song says. So are you there yet? Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 to 27, it reads this. Therefore, this is Jesus speaking, everyone who hears these words of mine, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Meaning that there is a response that accompanies you hearing. It's not just an auditory action of hearing the word of God that Jesus refers to. But he says, he says it's important that we not only listen, receive the audio that comes into our ears by way of the word or the words that we read, but it's important that your word or the word accompanies action, meaning that you have to do something about it. James chapter 1 verses 22 to 25 says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and do not obey, it is like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law, which sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Meaning that there is a blessing accompanying not just listening to the word, but acting on it, right? It's the same way in your relationship with your parents. When your parents tell you to do something, right, and you don't do it, there is no reward. But if your parents tell you to do something and you do it, not just hear it, but do it, there is a blessing that awaits you. That's not just a, a principle that pertains to your family, but that's a principle that pertains to your faith. If you listen to God's word and don't do anything about it, it's a waste. But if you listen to the word and not only listen, but it accompanies a change in your heart and a change in your mind and a change in your life to obey there's a blessing on the other side of obedience. So that's what Jesus is referring to, kind of long-winded there, but sometimes I go on tangents. So it says in verse 25, the rain came down and the streams rose. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rain came down and the stream rose and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. And then Jesus contrasts the, the person who built their house upon the rock was something else that wasn't mentioned in the song. He says in verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them to practice, listening to your parent but not doing what they say, anyone who hears the word but does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down and the floods came up, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. So Jesus contrasts a wise man who built his house upon the rock against 
a foolish man who built their house upon the sand. Now, for many of us who read the story, we're like, yeah, of course, Jesus, I'm going to build my house upon the rock. I'll do exactly what you say. I listen to the word and I obey, right? Building your house upon the rock. You see, but what Jesus is trying to get at is this word, foundations. The reason why the house on the rock was able to stand was because, in verse 25, because it had its foundation on the rock. So I want to ask you, what is your foundation today? Okay. Now, now we can think of this message and, and this parable as simply an, an architectural message, but we can also think about it metaphysically and spiritually. See, because we all have foundations. Some of you may be like, Sana, what is my foundation? Your foundation is what fuels you in this season. When I ask what, what is keeping you up, what, are you, what have you been up to? I'm asking what have you been doing to maintain level-headedness? What have you been able to do that has kept you sane, right? That's your foundation. Some of you, the thing that has kept you sane is your family. For some of you, the thing that has kept you sane is hope for the future. For some of you, Netflix is what has kept you sane. For some of you, video games has been your foundation. For some of you, your boyfriend or girlfriend or significant other has been the thing that has kept you going. What is the fuel that has kept you going? Because that is your foundation. So I want you to think about what your foundation is, right? And so Jesus says that my, anyone who hears my word and applies it, or obeys to it, or acts upon it, is somebody who has a foundation on me, on the rock, okay? And so Jesus gives us such a beautiful illustration, because not only is this parable relevant architecturally, but it's also relevant spiritually. And you may be like, what? how is it relevant architecturally? Think about it like this, okay? It's relevant and modern to us today in our world, right? I did a little bit of research. And I found that seven out of the ten most expensive houses in the world are built by some body of water. Meaning that seven of the ten most expensive houses in the world are built on or near the sand. Isn't that crazy? Because most of us would say, yes, Jesus, I'm building my house upon the rock. I'm building my house upon the rock. Well, it's actually harder to build your house upon the rock than it is to build your house upon the sand. And, and for those of you who are like, no, I still want to build my house upon the rock. Think about this. How many of you, and raise your hand or turn to somebody and give, me, give them confirmation or just wave to me or something, right? Let me know if you would like to buy a house, if you had all the money in the world, if you would like to have a house on the Florida Keys right now. Some of you are like, yes, I want a house on the Florida Keys. Raise your hand right now if you would like to have a house in Hawaii right now. Raise your hand if you would like to have a house in the Bahamas right now. You exactly prove my point. Most of us want to build our house upon the sand. Let me contrast that. How many of you want to build your house in Nepal by the, by the Himalayan mountains, by Mount Everest? Oh, very few of you. You know, some of you are adventurous. How many of y'all want to build your house in Colorado or Utah next to the Rocky Mountains? I don't know. And how many of you want to build your house near the Appalachian Mountains and live in West Virginia? And I mean no disrespect to anybody who's living in Utah or Colorado or, or West Virginia that may be watching this service. I mean no disrespect. All I'm saying is that if we had the choice whether to build our house upon the rock or build our house upon the sand, let's be honest. Most of us would build our houses on the sand. I'm not lying because it's beautiful. It's lovely. Everybody loves the views. Nobody wants to build their house upon a rock. It's, it's, it's ugly. It's, it's not as pretty a terrain as living on the sand. And I think it's relevant because so many of us live our lives in the same way. Oh, my foundation is God. Yeah, I, 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 my foundation is God. Well, how's your prayer life? Oh, my foundation is God, but I don't, I don't spend as much time as I probably should. I, you know, I spend once a week opening my Bible. Yeah, I say that God is my foundation. God, the rock, is my foundation. But on Saturday night, I'd rather go kick it with my homies than I would spend time doing other things like attending Bible study on Thursday. Wink, wink. Right? Because we say that if our foundation is God. But is that really relevant on our lives? We say a lot of things that don't necessarily correlate to what we actually do. That's why Jesus said it's not just important to hear, 
but it's important to do, right? And so my question to you is, what is your foundation, right? And, and the importance of a house is that when you build a house, every house needs to have some kind of foundation. What is the purpose of the foundation? The foundation is what allows the house to stand. You usually dig underground, and the foundation of the house is what supports it, similar to how the trunk of a tree is what holds the tree upright. If the trunk gets uprooted, the whole tree will come tumbling down. In the same way with your foundation is not, is not made correctly, your house will tumble over, just like it happened to the person in the sand. So I want to ask you, what is your foundation? What are you living for in this season of your life? Because some of you may say, I'm living for God, but your life is in contrast to that. Now, I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to point fingers. I just want you to self-reflect on what your foundation is because it will be critical to figuring out how you're going to survive in the season because I was doing a little bit more research on this topic and thinking about foundations right and uh, how many of you would like to live in Malibu the Malibu Hills right with all the rich and elite people right having a nice house in Malibu I remember there's a story that was that I read about in the LA Times where this famous architecture built some beautiful homes in Malibu, he focused on the chandeliers and the furniture and the glass panels were absolutely gorgeous. And, and the architecture was exquisite, top of the line. He built his house in the beautiful mountains, uh, the mountainous sandy area of Malibu. And everybody wanted the houses. And when they came out, the houses lasted a grand total of six months. They'd be like, what? You see, because... The houses that were built on the sand looked pretty in June, July, August, September, and October. But when November hit, seasons changed. And by January, the house that was looking pretty in Malibu found itself victim to what I call a Malibu mudslide. The houses that were on top of a sand mountain found itself at the bottom of a hill, found its foundation crumbling down. Because, see, there is a hidden value in foundations. See, what real estate agents will not tell you, what many people will not talk about, even though everybody wants to live in Beverly Hills and live on the beach in San Diego and Hawaii and the Bahamas and the, the Key West or Baja, California, what they will not tell you is that the value of a foundation is determined by the presence of a storm. I'm going to say it again, because this is, this is a key moment for us today. The value of a foundation is determined by the presence of a storm. You see, that house that was built in, in, in Beverly, the house that was built in Malibu was very pretty. It was beautiful. It was exquisite. It, they were houses that were top notch. But what the architecture failed to realize was that if he didn't build his house upon the rock, if the, if the rain came down, the house was going to fall too. And it must have been crazy because the person who built their house upon the rock, it was harder. Right? It's easy to dig up sand and plop a house right there, but it's much more difficult to excavate rock and hit rock and to push it aside and to build a house upon the contour of the rock. It's much more difficult to build your house upon the rock. I'm pretty sure when the person who was building his house upon the rock, I like, I like to make these stories colorful and think about them in, 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 in real ways. I bet the person who built his house upon the rock was like, dang, everybody's build, building their house upon the sand, and I'm working hard. And the people that were building their house upon the sand were like, what is that dummy doing over there building his house upon the What? That don't make sense. But don't you want to get the nice views? They don't look that nice upon that rock. But by January, the person who built his house upon the rock looked outside and saw that his house was still standing. And why is that? Because he had a good foundation. You see, a lot of us build our lives off of what I call functional foundations. Right now, how are you getting through? 
oh, I'm just, you know, just making do. Functional. How's your family? Oh, we're good. Functional. How's, how's, how's your prayer life? Oh, yeah, I pray. Functional. How, how, how's your, 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 your time alone with God? Oh, yeah, I have it, you know, every once in a while. Functional. How, how's your, how's your, 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 your relationship with all your friends? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're cool. Functional. Imagine if everything in your life was functional. Oh, it just worked. But it didn't flourish. You see, the presence of the storm teaches us the importance of a foundation. Because if your foundation is functional, it'll work. But it could very easily not find itself working anymore. You see, I want us as Christians, us as people, to move on from functional foundations into firm foundations. What's the difference between functional and firm foundations? Here's what it is. Firm foundations never crumble. When the storm comes and hits you, you will not crumble as a result of the storm. If you have a functional foundation, or if you have a firm foundation, a firm foundation is what the person who built their house upon the rock had, meaning that it was going to stand here and it was going to still stand regardless of what may come its way, regardless if the rain comes down, if it starts to pour, if the winds come and beat upon the house, it was still going to stand. Why? Because its house was built on a firm foundation. I want you to tell I want to tell you this person or friend, or family member of God. It is your season to flourish. It is your season for breakthrough. Just because you're cooped up in your house does not mean that God is not going to move things on your behalf. This is your season to grow in a way that you have never grown in your life prior to this season. This is your time to flourish. But you're not going to flourish until your foundation is firm. If it's just functional, you can't flourish. You're just okay with being mediocre. But this is your season to flourish. And the way in order for your life to flourish is that you have a firm foundation. It says, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. How is your foundation. I was thinking about my life, you know, doing some deep reflecting, thinking about my entire life and how everything has kind of worked itself out and God is still good and God is still making ways in my life and God is still using me for his purpose and I'm just excited for what God is going to do. But I remember as a kid, like I talked about that Cedarmont CD, I lived a very different life from many children <laughs> And I still recognize that I have a lot of learning to do because my parents had really sheltered me in life. And, uh, you know, when I grew up, I didn't grow up watching Superman or Batman or Ant-Man or Aquaman or Iron Man or Spider-Man or Wonder Woman. I didn't grow up watching any of those superheroes. My favorite superhero growing up as a kid was Bible Man. And Bible man used to defeat enemies like doubt and fear and anxiety using his foundation, using his helmet of salvation and his sword of the word of God. And I thought as a kid, that was my jam. Those are my cuts. I started to grow and, and that kind of Christian lifestyle maintained itself um, I started playing guitar in high school, and uh, I actually played, started playing guitar to impress a girl, but I'm not going not gonna to go too deep into that story. But I, I learned how to play guitar, and as soon as I got like a little bit good at playing it, my dad during church used to stand on this stage, this very stage that I'm standing on right now, <laughs> and used to go, all right, so my son's going to come up and sing a song. And I'd be like, Who, Me? We didn't prearrange for me to sing a song. That, that's not, that wasn't in the cards. So that was what I had to go through growing up as a kid. And one thing we also had to do this upcoming October in our church is called uh, White Sunday. And on White Sunday, we call it Children's Sunday. But uh, on White Sunday, every family in the church, in our church, is supposed to have a memory verse. In Psalm 1, we call it Kauloko. And that was supposed to be what we learned. And we were supposed to go and stand in front of the entire church and say our local. 
And everybody had theirs, and we had ours as a family that we had to memorize. And the difference between ours and many of the families was, uh, I don't know if this is a cultural thing or just a pastor's kid thing, but me being the pastor's kid, our mom used to assign us family memory verses that were like nine verses long. And we had to memorize all of them. And I will tell you, that was a grueling process. And my grandma had, would help us with some, and it was absolutely grueling. My sister used to cry every time we would practice because it was so hard to memorize, you know, nine verses at a time, memorize a chapter and recite it to the whole church. It was so difficult. And I remember as a kid, I started preaching at the first time I ever preached. I was at the age of 14 and I preached my first message at church. Uh, one of the first Sundays of the year is open testimony, open floor. And that was one of the first times that I ever preached. So I've been preaching. I'm 23 now. I've been preaching for close to 10 years. It's crazy. But uh, I didn't necessarily want to preach. My dad always asked me, oh, are you going to preach? Are you going to preach? Are you going to preach? And like, I kind of felt the pressure to do it. And so I kind of just did it. I ended up falling in love with it, as you can tell now. But, but uh, that was my upbringing. You know, as a kid, or when I started becoming a teenager and started, you know, playing sports and going into high school, I wouldn't get invited to parties and wouldn't get invited to go to friends' houses, wouldn't develop really deep friendships because I was the church kid. I do not like when people curse, and I will call you out if you are cursing in front of me. And I do not like, you know, behaviors that I felt at the time <laughs> were ungodly. And, and I, you know, friends wouldn't invite me to anything. I didn't really have really deep and meaningful friendships in high school because of my faith. And it was very difficult, you know, because I kind of grew up sort of resenting my role. You know, I may have showed up to church and, and, and you know, put on a face, but it was, for a long time, I really struggled with continuing to serve God because I was like, I want to do what everybody else, I want to go to the parties. I want to be the one that gets invited. I want to be the one that everybody knows. But every Saturday, I can't go out kicking with my friends. I got to stay and do choir practice. I got to stay and do worship team practice. I got to stay and prepare, you know, all of the audio and visual and tech stuff for the church. And I just resented it. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, God, that I say this. But at the time, I did not enjoy being a person of faith. Yeah, you know, I didn't enjoy... Being the religious guy, being the dude that did everything for mom and dad, that had to do the tech stuff. Because, you know, I was looking at all my friends. I was like, they're living it up, but I'm here cooped up at the house. I was going stir crazy, just like many of us are going stir crazy as a result of quarantine. You know, uh, I heard a comedian say, yeah, some ones have been quarantined their whole lives. But that was kind of me. And, you know, it must have been very lonely, just like it was lonely for me, for the person who built their house upon the rock. Because people say they want to build their house upon the rock, but do they really do it? And it was very lonely for me for a long period of my, my life. And then, you know, a storm hit in my life. A storm hit in my life. And it shook my foundations. And it really beat against me. And we all have storms. We're, we're, we're going through a storm right now called COVID. In the same way, I went through my own personal storm. And, you know, I'm not going to go into details what, to what that storm was. But I went through my own personal storm. And you know what's crazy is that foundation that was set way back when became the foundation that I held on to when I went through some of my most difficult times. Those songs that I didn't enjoy playing on the guitar when my dad would call me out. <laughs> would be the very songs that I would be singing in my room with tears flowing down my eyes. You know those, those verses that I hated to recite? Those were the verses that I held on to. Those, those Bible man discussions that we used to have and leading Bible study and all those stuff, that was what I held on to when it seemed as if everything was crumbling apart. I think that's so funny. What I didn't know was that my family was building a foundation. Had no idea at the time. But because of the foundation that they built in my life, 
I am here today because of the foundation that was brought into my life from a very young age that I used to resent is the same reason why I can tell you that if you will rebuild your foundation and retool yourself in this season, you will be able to make it through. And not only will you be able to make it through, but you will make it through on the other side blessed. You will make it through on this other side grown more than it was prior to this. I'm here to tell you that I resented the foundation that my parents had said to me. But now I can confidently say that I remember blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel or stands in the way of sinners. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. I can stand before you remembering the verse that I had where it says, but don't just listen to the word, you must obey. I can stand here and confidently say that I remember Romans 8, 28, where it says, and we know that in all things God works together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. I can stand before you knowing that if you will make it through the season, you will bear fruit. And the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. I can stand before you confidently and say that although you don't know what's going on, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. What I'm trying to say was that there was a foundation that I did not know what was that was being set up for me, but now I recognize it. Now I know that had it not been for the foundation that was set for me, that I didn't enjoy as a kid, I am here now confidently here to say that I am grateful for the foundation. I'm not here to brag about how much of the Bible I know because there's still so much that I got to know. I only know a portion of it. But what I'm here to say is that your foundation is crucial. And if you do not have a firm foundation when the storm comes and does what it does, shakes everything up, brings precipitation down, and really tests what you're made of, if your foundation is functional but not firm, everything will crumble to the ground. Everything will fall apart. Because it is so important, it is so vital that your foundation is firm in this season. Jesus said that this is the foundation. In Matthew, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, all scripture is God-breathed. It is so vital and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Everything. Not only is the Bible relevant, it is so useful, and it's what we can stand on when we don't know what to stand on. When I've gone through difficult seasons, I've got to turn to the Bible and say, this is my confidence, that I will see the goodness of the Lord while in the land of the living. I can stand here and boldly say that I know God will make a way. Why? Because he's made a way time after time after time again. Not just in my own life, but, but think about the time where, where God parted the Red Sea. Where God helped David. Where God strengthened Simon, Samson. Where God changed Paul's life. Where God used Gideon. Where God used Rahab. Where God told Hosea to go and marry a prostitute. And after she cheated on him, he said, no, go take her back to show grace. There are so many instances in the Bible that we can take as our foundation. I can't stand it when people say, you use the Bible as an acronym and they say, what's the Bible? The Bible is acronym, basic instructions before leaving earth. That's what you think about the word of God? I heard that the word of God is alive and active, sharper than two, any two-edged sword. I, I've read that, you know, the Bible is not just, it's not just an instruction manual. If you think that the Bible is just an instruction manual, you got it all wrong. The Bible is a love letter. The Bible is a song book. The Bible is the creation story. The Bible is history. The Bible is a dermatology lesson. The Bible is an inspirational story. The Bible is a mirror to your heart. The Bible is a future teller. And you think that it's just an instruction manual? I am here to shatter that notion. Absolutely. This means everything to me. 
The reason why I'm still here and sane and still able to encourage you is not because I passed the level on Call of Duty, not because I just survived. No, because this has been what I've held on to. Hebrews says that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Where does the hope come from? It comes from this. In this, I found that my God will love me. I found that my God blesses me and keeps me and causes his face to shine upon me and gives me peace. In this word, I found that God says that I'm never left or forsaken. I've, I've learned in this word that he loved me so much that he died on the cross for my sins. I found that, 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 that I can go through all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have found in the word time after time again that what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. And that his grace is sufficient enough for me. And he's, that he's broken strongholds and opened valleys and made ways to over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I'm not just saying that for effect. I'm just saying that because that is the truth. In the word, God says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is so much in here. And this needs to be our foundation. You see, I heard a saying recently that storms build character. That was a saying that I, I heard constantly. And the reality of the matter is that, yes, storms build character. Some people's character. But not all of us. Storms don't build all of our characters. But here's what storms do to all of us. Storms test all of our foundations. Storms test whether you are going to make it out on the other side. Storms, well, there are so many people who, when the storm comes, they cower under the pressure. And they check out. And they're done. And they quit. And they give up on life. But the storm could actually serve to be the very thing that leads you closer to God. Closer than ever in your life. What this storm is doing in all of our lives. COVID has been a storm. The election has been a storm for many of us. Race relations in our country that are heartbreaking have been a storm for all of us. You have storms in your own personal life. But we can all admit that this has been a season of storms for all of us. And the question is, what do you hold on to in this moment? Because it is your foundation that will determine whether you cower and crumble underneath the pressure like the person who built their house on the sand. Or you will be able to flourish in this season of your life. It is really, really crucial, family of God, that we know what our foundation is. Is it on God? This is, I love this because this is a pivotal moment in our lives. Is God our foundation? Or is the world our foundation? Everything else is in our foundation. Notice how I said my family set the foundation. I love my family. And no disrespect, my, I love my family so much. But my family is not my foundation. My family set a foundation. But even if things were to go awry and my family ties were broken, things happened and, and lines were drawn in the sand, my foundation was never my family, but my foundation was my faith in God. That is my foundation. My family helped develop the foundation. My time with God helped develop the foundation. But it is not my foundation. Okay, Football is something that I enjoy. It's a passion of mine. But it's not my foundation. My friends. I love my friends. But they're not my foundation. My foundation is the word of God. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, in Matthew chapter 4, just a few chapters before, Jesus was in the desert. And the enemy tempted him. And what did Jesus use to combat the enemy? He said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What Jesus said is that I do not need this or this or this or this or this or this. You name what it is. Jesus said all that I need to be sustained 
is the word of God. My dad told us in seminary, and when he preaches sometimes, he says, one of his seminary professors said, eat the word of God. Because the word of God, just like how I talked about sustain me through the storm, I'm here to tell you that if you build your foundation on the word of God, you will be sustained regardless of whatever storm may come your way if the word is your foundation. And for some of you, you're like, I'm in the middle of a storm, I can't build. No, 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 no. This is your time to build. This is your time to flourish. This is your time to make it through. I'm here to encourage you right now and declare over your life that this period is not going to finish you. This period, God is not done with you. God is still going to work through you. I just want to let you know somebody is down and distraught and and in a difficult spot right now. You're in a bind. I want to let you know that God is not done with you. You, God is not done with you. Declare this over your life right now. God is not done with you. But you need to start building your life around him. If God is not done with you, do not quit on him. If there is still breath in your bones, if there is still vitality in your soul, you have to realize that God is not done with you, but it is time for you to start refocusing, retooling, and start rebuilding that foundation. If you, even if you've got to start from the ground up, it's time for us as a church and as a people to start flourishing. And how do we do that? By building the foundation. Quarantine doesn't mean that you have to be cooped up in your house and not do anything. It is so important that we're building a foundation. How do I build a foundation? By reading the word of God. By spending time in the presence of God. By making time to worship God. I heard, I heard somebody say, you make time for things that you love. If you really profess to love God at the level that you do say you do, like, I, I, I love, I'm building my house upon the rock. Then it has to be fruits that are born in your life. There has to be things that are evidence that God is really a part of your life. James said that faith without works is dead. So if we love the word of God, and it's our foundation, There has to be fruits that are manifested in our life. And that's my encouragement for you today. God is not done, but you need to start building today, friend and family of God. Okay? And in the past two weeks has been something completely heartbreaking in our homeland of American Samoa. I read an article in Samoa News that said in the last two weeks, four young people have committed suicide on our homeland. Some people that are in America from American Samoa don't know that. Four people have committed suicide in our little homeland of American Samoa. And it makes me emotional because I think about that many kids are religious. You know that American Samoa is 97.5% Christian? They, they're religious. But religion without foundation is a failure. Religion without relationship and a foundation that is truly set in your heart, not just set for you by your family, but the one that you receive is pointless. But it is so important. And I want, I want somebody, I want to encourage you right now, if you were ever contemplating anything like that, I want you to know that your foundation must change if you are feeling this. You can't just profess that your foundation is your faith. You cannot just say it, but it has to be something that you live out. And I don't want anybody in our community, in this world, to ever lose sight of the fact, and I want to help you build the foundation. I want to let you know that you listening to me right now is helping to build that foundation because I am preaching the word of God. This is my foundation. And I just want to encourage you knowing that this foundation has changed my life. And this foundation can change your life too. This foundation that is the word of God, that is scripture, that is fellowshipping with the people of God is a foundation that has gotten me through so much. And I know that it's the same foundation that will be able to get me through whatever I go through. And I just want to encourage you that that's what I plead for all of us. And I want to congratulate you. Because you're five months into this quarantine period. You've made it through five months. And you're still standing. You're still here. You're still alive. 
You're still breathing. You're still watching me. You're still, you may not be able to see, but you're listening to me right now. You are still here. Congratulate yourself that you are still alive. You are still kicking. You are still standing. The enemy tried to huff and puff and blow your house down, but you are still here. The enemy tried to get you and thwart you off of what God has planned for your life, but because God still wants you here, you are still here. You are still standing, and because you are still standing, you still have the strength to change things. You still have the strength to build this foundation, to build this firm foundation that cannot be shaken when the winds blow and the rains come down and the seas come up, but your foundation can remain firm. You are still here to build that foundation today. Congratulate yourself because you're still here. And because you're still here, God's not done with you yet, but you got to start building that foundation Right now. And in Jesus' life. He was beaten. Just like the winds beat against the house. Punches poured down to his face. And the enemy thought that he had victory over Jesus. And he thought he beat him. And it looked like he did. And Jesus died and was in the tomb for those few days. But on the third day, whew, on the third day, Jesus rose and he showed his hands. Mm -hmm. And he showed his hands to show that he had been scarred. He had been hit. He had been beaten. The enemy blew at the house, the foundation that was the word that kept him okay. But Jesus looked at them and said, I'm still here. And I'm alive. Friends and family, you are still here and you are still alive. And Jesus is still on the throne. But it is time for you to make that decision to shore up your foundation. And I want to help you as you shore up that foundation today. So, one of the important pieces of the foundation that I was growing up in, that I grew up in, was that my mom always said, when I first started preaching, she said, make sure... Every time you preach, tie it back to Jesus. Jesus has done so much for us. And all that he asks is that we use him as our firm foundation. And for those of you who are looking to build a new found foundation, it begins with the relationship. It begins with, as scripture says, opening your mouth to declare Jesus as your Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. If you do so, you will be saved. And I want that relationship to begin for somebody today. This storm is testing all of our foundations. Will you begin building that house? You're still here for a purpose. Will you choose to start building that foundation on God today? And if you do, it begins with the relationship. And I want to lead you to be able to make that decision of accepting Jesus Christ into your, new, into your life so that he can make you a new creation. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me if you want to make that decision today. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I acknowledge that you died on the cross to forgive my sins and rose to give me life. I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. From this day forward, I choose to love you I choose to serve you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends and family, if you have made that decision with me today, I believe that you have begun the process of building a firm foundation. And if you hold tight to the promises of God, that foundation will be firm for the rest of your life. So that regardless of what storm may come your way, the true value is found. In the house that was built upon the rock. In the house that was built upon the rock. That still stood. Even when everything else crumbled. And I'm here to tell you that you will stand. If your foundation is firm. In Jesus name. Amen.